the headlines this week for Africa. The deadly killer diseases stalking Africa. Not just AIDS anymore. There's so many. We do not live in paradise. Genesis 3 is where we're going to look in just a moment. But Genesis 1 and 2 present to us a perfect world. In fact, look at the last verse of chapter 1. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. It was in consonance with his character, which is holy, with his whole uh, attribute of his goodness. And, and God's creation reflected his glory. And it was good. And it was perfect. But whatever happened to paradise, the vast, perfectly good universe God created, the perfect earth where no sin existed in Genesis 1 and 2, where did it go? By the way, the Bible has 1,189 chapters. Two of them, 1 and 2 of Genesis, talk about a perfect world. The next 1,185 talk about a cursed world. The last two, 21 and 22 of Revelation, talk about the perfect world again. So if you want to, I mean, if anybody wants to summarize the Bible real quickly, say, this book has four chapters, two on each end, like bookends of perfection and 1185 of curse, destruction, and sin. And that's why the gospel is such good news. Well, what a place this universe must have been with all the glow of creation unshrouded by sin. The universe where every creature was good, where every part of the universe was singing the glory of God, where there was no groaning under the burden of sin, no death, destruction, and decay. But something drastic happened. Of course, we know Adam and Eve's sin. Look at Genesis 3 just briefly to introduce this. Verse 16, look what God says to Eve. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband. Now, we're going to, in this study, look at the effects of the fall. Not today, but how the fall uh, totally demolished man and woman, as well as marriage, as well as family, as well as all parts of life. And by the way, this desire shall be for your husband is not a positive statement. Just, that's what God said to Eve, the pain of childbirth and all that. Uh, but look at verse 17. To Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I command you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. So look at this. In toil... You shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And so the whole idea of the ground no longer prolifically bringing forth and serving man, but man now having to fight to survive. And then, look in verse 22. Uh, They were put out. The Lord God said in verse 22 of chapter 3, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he stretch out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him from the garden. You say, what's that? Well, God says, now that they are fallen, if they take the tree of life, they will eternally exist fallen. They will become like the devil and his angels. So God restricted the tree of life and didn't let them so they would have opportunity for redemption. Well, this is paradise lost. And that's what we're looking at, paradise lost. Uh, that term was uh, immortalized by the great British author and poet John Milton, 1667, if you remember from English Lit. He wrote Paradise Lost. Is at the height of the Civil War of England. If you know anything about their history, 1667, great civil unrest, 200 years before our Civil War. But in the midst of all that confusion, he writes this epic Paradise Lost, talking about the decline and fall of man. And then, of course, he wrote its sequel, Paradise Restored. But what happened when Paradise was lost? Well, when Adam sinned, the earth was corrupted. And Adam immediately lost his rulership over this planet. And because all of us fell in Adam, and because he lost his kingdom and his right to rule, we don't see any longer the earth as it was with him serving man and woman. You see, the earth originally was subject to man. The earth was made by God to supply all of our needs without us having to do anything. He had only to accept and to enjoy the earth as it provided for him. Just think about it. I mean, when we travel east, we have these little places we go and pick different things at different seasons. And here in Oklahoma, we go out to the peach place. Um, But you look at an orchard and you see that beautiful fruit and it's there. And all of a sudden, if you don't get it in time, splat, jumps on the ground and it gets all wormy and everything. That's not how God made it. The fruit never fell. There were no fruit flies. There were no bugs that laid eggs in the blossoms so that the worms would eat their way out of the apples. And, you know, if you have a wormhole, it's too late. It's already come out. You know, I mean, that's the idea. Uh, It's a fallen world. 
Well, tempted by Satan, man sinned. The tempter took the place of the rulership. And there you see the change in the chain of command. Man, who God put at the top of his creation, fell to the bottom. And the earth that was supposed to be under man, serving him, came above man, resisting him. And above all that, the prince of the power of the air, like Ephesians 2 says, the children of disobedience walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, the God of this world. And everything was flipped around. Well, if you pay much attention to the ecology of this planet, you realize we don't rule this world. It rules us. And with all our modern technology, we must constantly be fighting against the earth for our survival. We have to to try and squeeze out of it food. We have to try and hold its onslaught in all the bad weather. And all this is basically the downward spiral. Well, what else happened to Adam after he sinned? Well, if you keep reading in, in the, the next chapter, chapter 4, talks about the whole murder in the family of Adam as Cain kills Abel. And it isn't long after that we have polygamy in the same chapter. In the next few chapters, death, all of chapter 5. By the time we come to chapter 6 of Genesis, God is sending a flood and destroys all of mankind except for one family. That's how bad it gets. Well... The scriptures tell us that the prince of the earth, the head of this system of the world, is Satan. In fact, here's a verse to remember. 1 John 5, 19, let me read it to you. It says this. This is what the Apostle John says. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Because of the paradise that God created lost by Adam and Eve's fall into sin, it usurped everything into the hands of Satan. Now, I know it's part of God's plan. And he has redemption planned. But that's where we are. And when man lost his rightful place, he lost his mastery of himself as well as the earth. And so man and woman became totally sinful and became slaves to sin. And that's not all. The animal kingdom, which was at creation, subservient to man, now is only subservient out of fear. Remember, God put into animals the fear of man. They were out of affection. They served us. Much of the animal kingdom was no longer able to be tamed after the fall. The ground, which originally produced good things naturally and abundantly, and for us to have for the taking, now produces thorns and weeds and other harmful things naturally and abundantly. In fact, yesterday was annual yard cleaning day. We had the whole crew out there. In fact, my neighbor came, leaned over the fence and said, Are you having a wedding here? I said, what do you mean? He says, why, all of you are out working so hard. I said, no, we always work hard. You know, I mean, I just put them out to work, and I was sitting there drinking my... No, not really. No, 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 I was working too. But no longer does the ground produce good things. It's just so harmful. Uh, The good things man now gets from the earth come only by toilsome effort. And, And the earth is subjected to extremes of heat and cold and poisonous plants and reptiles and insects and earthquakes and tornadoes and floods and hurricanes and disease and war. And all that was released because of the fall. Virtually everything God has given for man's good and blessing has become our enemy. And we are fighting a losing battle. And for thousands of years, man has looked at mankind dying. And now we're stepping back and we're saying it's not just mankind that's dying. Our planet is dying. That was a cover in Time Magazine recently. The dying planet. And it talked about... Oh, well, we experienced this when we lived in New England. There, there were a lot of commercial fishermen, and they would go out in their big boats, and they used to tell these tall tales about in the early days, whenever that was, of fishing. They weren't that old. They said, we used to go out to St. George's Bank, which is off of the coastal seaboard there by New uh, England and Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Labrador, and they'd go up there, and they'd just drop their nets down. They'd pull through, and they had a full load, and they'd come right back. Just one day's catch. Now, they toil for eight to ten days, and they come back half full because they said there just aren't fish out there. It used to be they said that they would drop their nets, and there were walls of fish, hundreds of feet thick, just like on top of each other. And now they have to just drag those nets all over the place, and they can't find anything. The planet's dying. And that's just part of the story. If we listen real carefully, we can hear the sounds of this planet groaning under sin. And I want to show you that in Romans chapter 8. If you want to turn to the New Testament now, from Genesis to Romans, sixth book 
of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, chapter 8. Because this morning, through the scriptures, if we listen carefully, we can hear the universe sobbing around us. It is the groan of the weight of sin that now enslaves the perfections of this cosmos. Specifically, we're going to read verses 18 to 22. Romans 8, and I'll read and you follow along, verses 18 to 22. This is what Paul says very, very directly to this point we're covering, Paradise Lost. Verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. What's that about? Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility. I'm going to explain that a little bit later. Not willingly. In other words, creation did not walk in willingly submitting itself to sin like Adam and Eve did. No, no. Creation, God decreed, had to be under and subject to sin and futility. Now, verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, that means when we are like him and know him because we'll see him as he is, the universe, that's Revelation 21, will be liberated from the curse. But look at verse 22. For we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. The whole universe is sobbing and groaning because of the crushing weight of sin. You know a graphic picture of that? Italy this week, a six-story apartment building with 70-some people in it, just collapsed like a stack of pancakes. You know what the reporter said? The four main corner, it was a certain kind of construction. It was just held up on the four corners. The people that lived there said it was the most unique thing. Every day in your apartment, you could hear... It was creaking and groaning. The whole thing was groaning under the weight of the apartment. And those four gave way this week and just crushed all the people, killed most of the people inside. You know, that sound, that's what God can hear from this universe. The whole universe is creaking, groaning under the weight of sin, awaiting the redemption. Let's bow together and thank the Lord for the good news and ask him to open our hearts to lessons from the fall. Father in heaven, thank you that your word is so beautiful, that the historical report of uh, the fall and paradise lost in Genesis 3 is the theme and the redemption that you provide of all of your word, of your kingdom coming, of your will being done, of your redemption being wonderfully manifest in the person of our Savior, your Son our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we would learn some lessons from the fall in this series and learn to not listen to the lie of Satan and most of all, to learn to humble ourselves as the essence of sin and the fall finds its root in the pride of Lucifer. May we clothe ourselves willingly with humility today. Lest paradise continue to be lost and not regain through your wonderful redemption. Thank you, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter 8, look at verse 19. The earth knows its condition. It's groaning because the anxious longing to be redeemed and released. And God has subjected the earth, as it says in verse 21 of Romans 8, to the curse in order that man might continually have trouble. Yeah, that's what's so amazing. We spend all of our time getting these devices to make life not so toilsome. God wants life to be toilsome, to remind us that we're frail and feeble and that we are failing and that we are fragile and death is inevitable. And it points us to the only hope that Christ is the answer. That's, that's why everything's falling apart. Well, the earth, aware of its curse that came with Adam's fall, is groaning for the day when the sons of God are manifested in the kingdom, for the earth knows that it too will be liberated from corruption. That's the promise we have. But in the meantime, we are subjected to this earth. We plant, but we're not sure what we'll reap, especially in my backyard, my garden. Uh, we build cities and houses and dams and monuments, but they're all subject to destruction, whether lightning or earthquake or flood or fire or erosion or simply by aging. They collapse, they fall apart. That's the fall. 
We learn to live our lives in jeopardy every hour. Just at the height of professional achievement, some develop tumors in their brain and they've totally lost their future ability to earn an income. At the brink of their athletic fame, some athlete can be injured and become a helpless paralytic. We fight ourselves, we fight one another, we fight the earth, and every day we read, we hear of the distress of nations, the impossibility to agree between uh, different nations of the world. There is social conflict, economic hardship, health hazards, military threats. I mean, the, the new prime minister of Russia just announced that they're going to practice with their their atomic bomb-bearing jets. And he says they're going to fly from from Moscow to Cuba and land in Cuba. And then they're going to fly from Cuba to Vietnam. And they're going to show us, by flexing their atomic bomb muscles, that they're still a military threat. We hear the whine of pain from animals. We see the struggle of trees and crops as they battle against disease and against insects. In fact, our hospitals that dot this land, the doctors, the medicines, the pesticides, the insurance companies, the fire and police departments, and all the funeral homes bear testimony that we live in a cursed earth. And we do. Paradise is lost. That's why creation groans. But God didn't intend it to be this way. And it's going to be this way only for a little while until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of his Christ and we will reign with him forever and ever. And the ravenous nature of wild animals and of many human beings will be changed and the crops and the trees will no longer be infested and the the game of politics will be over and true peace will come and man redeemed will reign. And as it says in Isaiah, that there will be the hammering of swords into plowshares and the hammering of spears into pruning hooks as a millennial peace pervades this planet. That's all part of God's wonderful plan. But what happens between Genesis 1 and 2 that led to Genesis 3? Well, that's what we need to examine. If you want to turn back to Genesis 3, we're going to look at just a couple of points before we venture into the history of the fall. But Genesis chapter 3 introduces us to the bad guy. Genesis 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Now we can't blame it on the snakes, although most of us don't like snakes. I remember the last one we killed in our yard, we measured it. It was 63 inches long. Do you know that's over 5 feet? That's as tall as my wife. I mean, that was a big one. And you know what? You You know those branch loppers? I tried to get its head. Those things are tough. You can't even cut their heads off. Don't blame it, though, on the serpents. Look at verse 17. Because you listened to the voice of your wife. Why did Adam listen to the voice of his wife? Because Satan spoke to her through the serpent. And before the fall, before weeds and poisonous plants and thorns and thistles, before all that was the wicked venom of the serpent. We need to see what event took place that takes us from Genesis 131 and all of chapter 2 of perfection to where we are today. Did you know the whole universe? I mean, I'm not exaggerating. In fact, in physics, the law of entropy refers to the constant irreversible degradation of matter and energy in the universe to increasing disorder. All of the laws that produce dust and decay and death clearly contradict the theory of evolution because our world believes the premise that the natural world is inclined to continual self-improvement. But it's evident everywhere in our world we look that that's not true, that everything is going back to dust. I mean, even in your little garden plot, if you leave it alone, the weeds take over. The tomatoes don't. The weeds do. There's just a tendency toward disorder. But how did that happen? Well, verse 1 of Genesis 3 says, Now the serpent. Let me give you a real quick uh, study of Satan. He's introduced in Genesis 3. He's unmasked in Revelation 12. It says, Now the serpent of old, the adversary, is Satan, the dragon. So what we find is, if we compare Genesis 3 with Revelation 12, that the serpent in the garden was Satan. How do you get in the garden? To answer that, let's turn to the middle of our Bibles to Ezekiel 28. I want to give you a real quick biographical 
portrait of Satan. If you go to the middle, you should hit Psalms. Go to the right, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, chapter 28. And you should mark this because you'll hear all your life people say, in fact, recently the news magazines covered, do you believe in Satan and hell and all that stuff? And people aren't sure where it came from. Well, Ezekiel 28 tells us where it came from. And also Isaiah 14, we'll see in a minute. Look at Ezekiel 28, verse 11. This is the fall of Satan. By the way, many parts of scripture have a a two-fold view. Uh, Primarily in view here is the king of Tyre. That was a little island off the coast of Israel, a Phoenician city. But behind him was the real king of Tyre, the head of all the nations of the world, the god of this world, and that's who Ezekiel's looking at. Let me show you what I mean. Start in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. And say to him, thus says the Lord God. Now, this message alternates between the king, literally, this man that lived on that island, and the invisible, towering over him, God of this world, Satan. Verse 12 in the middle. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Do you really think that king was that good looking? I don't. He's talking now about Satan. Look at verse 13. You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Do you think the king of Tyre had ever been the Garden of Eden? I doubt it. It was destroyed in the flood. Uh, Every precious stone was your covering. And then it names them. Sardis, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. By the way, there are nine stones mentioned, and they are quite similar to the 12 that were on the breastplate of the high priest, but are dissimilar, and that's part of Satan's... uh, He is so much like the things of God, but just bent enough to be deadly because he's a false worker. But look at this. This is fascinating. The end of 13. This is a little warning for us today. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You know what that tells us? Satan was the worship leader of heaven. Did you know that? He's involved with music. You, know, you always hear people say, oh, music is ah, morals. the words that matter. You know, the music can't, oh, oh, wait a minute. Satan's realm is music. And if Satan can corrupt music, he can reach the whole world. Did you know, just this year, I mean, we've been, we were, you know, at Volgodots, we were in the Holy Land and all that. Did you know that all over the world, two things of America have pervaded Coke and our music? I mean, they're sitting drinking Diet Coke and listening to our music. Be very careful about music. Music is the realm that Satan seeks to counterfeit in. And music is not neutral. It's a force, either for good or evil. Look at verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, we know about seraphim and cherubim. There are four cherubs that that are always looking at God. Remember, covered with eyes, chapter 4. You know that from Revelation. We covered that in the Revelation series. But he was a different breed of cherub. It says that he was, see what it says? The anointed, by the way, anointed, that word, if you could read it in Hebrew, is Mashiach, Messiah. You were the anointed, you were the the select, the very special cherub. He was the one and only cherub who covers. What was he doing? Well, if it it appears, if, if we can describe this, it seems like he was behind and a little bit, uh, kind of reflecting back on God. He was behind his throne, and as God's glory emanated, he reflected it back on him and kind of led all the universe in praising and worshiping God. He was the covering, kind of like the canopy uh, behind a king's throne. He was kind of like up behind there, being the covering, reflecting cherub. I established you, verse 14, God says. I, I put you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. What's all that? Well, do you remember Daniel 9 when we covered that? That it says the throne of God is here and issuing out of the throne of God is a river of liquid fire. There's just a liquid river of fire flowing out from his thrones. And so if you put it together, there seem to be stones in that river. And it says, look at that, that you walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones, walking in this river of fire in front of God. Satan walked back and forth and then would cover and reflect God. And it says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, verse 15, till iniquity was found in you. 
can't be the king of Tyre. He was not perfect. No one is perfect that's ever been born on this planet. Adam was created perfectly, and Eve was created from him, and Jesus Christ, with no human father, was perfect, but no human that's ever been born of natural descent was perfect. can't be the king of Tyre. It has to be Satan. And iniquity was found in him. Uh, halfway down through verse 16, Out of the mountain of God I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Why? Verse 17, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. What he was was he started believing the press reports. He started enjoying all this glory coming up, and it started intoxicating him. He started breathing it in, and instead of reflecting it, he began to absorb it. Do you know what humility is? When people say something wonderful to you, you don't catch it like a fly ball and go, you're right, oh boy, yeah, oh I am, you know, you reflect it back and give it back to the Lord, say, what have I that I have not received, why do I, why do I glory as if I didn't receive it, you see, we're not sponges, we're supposed to be mirrors reflecting glory back to God, Satan left being a mirror and he became a sponge and he started loving it, and that's pride, well, what happened, back up to Isaiah 14 to finish the story, Isaiah chapter 14 rounds out the story of the fall of Lucifer. And Isaiah 14 tells us, starting in verse 12, that to understand the the titanic, catastrophic fall of man and woman, we have to see that in God's perfection he had made this, this anointed cherub, Satan, who prior to his fall had an exalted position in the presence of God. The brilliance of heaven was his surrounding. He was called the anointed covering cherub. He enjoyed the position of high honor in front of God, and Isaiah calls him, look at verse 12 of Isaiah 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. He's called the son of the dawn, the morning star in the NIV, King James, Lucifer, the star of the morning. He was, he was the bright and glowing one, the most beautiful and glorious of all of God's created beings. And after he fell and became God's chief adversary, by the way, the Hebrew word for adversary is Satan, adversary. He became God's adversary, Satan, we call him. He was never again called by the honorable titles, son of morning, morning star, Lucifer, son of the dawn. But in his pre-fall in chapter 14 of Isaiah, verse 12, He was filled with wisdom, filled with beauty. He was blameless, the scriptures tell us. But his fall is described here in Isaiah because of his pride. And let's read about that. Keep keep reading uh, verse 13. This contains the five downward damnable steps Satan took. For you have said in your heart, Isaiah 14, 13. Number one, I will ascend into heaven. He was acting independent of God. What was he supposed to do? He was supposed to walk around in front of God and, and reflect his glory back and, and put the spotlight on God. And he says, no, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up there myself. I'm going to do my own thing. So this, this independent spirit. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He was supposed to be God's servant, leading the worship. And he says, I'm going to be over all the angels. See, asserted himself. He's going to take over. Self-assertion, independence. Kind of sounds like a leadership course, doesn't it? In America. Where do you think they got it from? Look at the third part of verse 13. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Here's another little facet. Did you know in God's temple, in God's tabernacle, there are no chairs? Who's the only one who gets to sit down? God. Everybody else is ceaselessly worshiping him. What does Lucifer say? I'm going to sit down. I'm going to soak it in, man. I'm going to have everybody looking at me. You see the independence, the self-assertion, and this lust for being pleased. And then he says, on the farthest sides of the north, I will send above the heights of the clouds. He says, I'm going to be the big cheese. But here, the last part of verse 14 is one of the most profound proofs of inspiration I've ever found in the Bible. If, if a, ma- a mere mortal wrote this book, you know what ver- the end of verse 14 would say? I will be greater than the Most High. You know what the proof of inspiration is? Lucifer, created being, knew he was created being, knew he was created by God, and knew that nothing created could ever be greater than the Creator. So what did he say? I don't want to be greater than God. That's impossible. I will be like 
the Most High. I'm going to get his place. You know what the temptation is for us? Most of us will never, you know, worship Buddha over God. But you know what we will do? We'll put something else on the same level as God. Our job, our career, pleasures, family, wife, husband, children, whatever, money. We'll put it equal with God. And that's all Satan said is, I'm going to just move my stuff up on God's shelf. And what did God do? Well, God threw him down. You know, it's difficult for our finite minds to understand how a perfect being in a perfect environment could fall into sin. Ezekiel and Isaiah describe Lucifer's motivation. Ezekiel says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Isaiah 14 says that you said, I will, I will, I will. But the net effect is that he fell. And the first sin was pride. And every sin after that has been in some way merely an extension of that pride. Let me close with you in James, okay? James, uh, near the, go to the right, New Testament. It's uh, the little epistle of James, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. So back up about seven books from Revelation from the end. In chapter 4, pride led the angel Lucifer to exalt himself above his creator because he was formerly the bright star of the morning and continually was exerting and, and asserting himself, saying, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. He opposed God's will, and God cast him out of heaven. Because he said, I am a God, the Lord cast him from the mountain of God. And the original sin of Adam and Eve was pride, because they trusted their own way, plans, and understanding over God's. And so, pride is the supreme temptation Satan offers us. Pride will be at the heart of his evil nature, and so he makes it sure it's at the heart of our temptations. We are always in a battle with pride until we get into the Lord's presence, and the only protection against pride and our only source of humility is having a proper view of God. And pride is the sin of competing with God. And humility is submitting to God. In pride, we compete. We say, I can run my life. I can make my own plans. I can do my own thing. I don't need you. I got enough money. I don't need to trust you. I mean, we have a billion varieties of pride. Designer lust, as Jim Berg calls it. God says, I want you to submit every part of your life to me. How do we do that? Look at chapter 4 of James, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. What will that do? It will resist the devil. And what will happen? He'll flee from us. We must resist him, starting by a submission to God. The result, he'll flee from us. Look at verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. We must consciously choose to not catch all those fly balls of praise coming toward us. Say, yep, yep, oh, man, you're, oh, yeah, that's, oh, you got me. We need to reflect the glory back to God. In fact, Paul said in Colossians 3, clothe yourself with humility. I see all of your beautiful church clothes you all are wearing today. You picked them out. You thought about it and you put them on. Did you just as consciously choose to clothe yourself with humility and say, I will not sponge up your glory, God. I'll reflect it back. We've got to live it out this week. So let's bow and ask the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, I thank you that you have promised to us That if we will humble ourselves, if we will clothe ourselves with humility, if we will draw nigh to you, you will draw nigh to us. And you will lift us up. And you will let us in our weakness and our failures accomplish eternal benefit. I pray that this morning we will stop competing with you. That we will stop living our life our way and having it all figured out, and we will turn it over to you. And that we'll not let Satan's lies give us a wrong view of you so we don't trust you, we don't think you're good, and we trust ourselves and go our own way. I pray this morning will be a conscious moment of turning in many hearts that your spirit would prompt us to stop competing and start submitting and to willfully clothe ourselves with humility. And we'll thank you for what great things you do in our lives 
as through Christ, paradise is regained. Thank you. And all of God's saints said, Amen.